Hello, Tansi Anin. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. The family of Amber Tuckero, chiefs, and the RCMP are again pleading with the public for anyone to come forward with knowledge of Amber's disappearance and death. 21-year-old Amber Tuckero was last seen August 18, 2010, near Edmonton, Alberta. A man's voice was captured on a call from her phone, but has never been identified. Two years later, her remains were found in a wooded area near Leduc, just south of Edmonton. The RCMP apologized for deficiencies in how they handled her case in 2019. Tuckero's family says many of the issues they experienced persist to this day. For the RCMP or whoever takes the information, when a parent r reports their child missing, put yourself in their shoes and, and think, well, what if that was me? What if that was my child? And I get told, oh, they'll come home. They'll come home when they're done party. Just, just give that a thought. It's going on 13 years. We still have no answer. We still have... We still don't know who Amber's killer is. We heard a mom who's hurting and a family and a community that's devastated by what happened. So I would say this, the people that are out there that know, that have information, no matter what they think that is, I would ask them to come forward as well. This investigation is not going, it's not stopping, and this family's commitment to making change is not going to stop either. So I would like to reassure you that from the top of this organization that we're committed to moving this investigation forward and will continue to do so. As the trial against RCMP officers charged in his death began, the family of Dale Culver held a press conference this week in Prince George, British Columbia. Culver died in RCMP custody in 2017. APTN's Lee Wilson has more. At a press conference at Prince George, Dale Culver's family members share how his loss devastated their family. In 2017, Dale Culver, a 35-year-old father of three, died when RCMP officers in Prince George attempted to arrest him. Their family detailed an emotionally draining process over the years with the coroner's office, police oversight bodies, legal advocacy groups, RCMP, and now the courts. We've had to navigate a system that is just horrendous. And we've had to navigate a system that is somewhat disrespectful, somewhat exhausting, and trying to have figure out how to navigate that system as a family. But know any family that goes through this, you have a voice. If something doesn't feel right, something doesn't look right, ask the questions. Over a month ago, BC Prosecution Service charged five officers concerning the death of Dale Culver. Two officers, Constable Paul St. Marie and Jean Francis Monet, faced manslaughter charges. Three officers, Sergeant Biani Osubio, Constables Arthur Dalman and Alexander McDonald, faced obstruction of justice charges. Dale Culver's daughter, now 20 years old, Lily Speed Demox has spent nearly six years seeking justice. And no one deserves to die in the hands of the RCMP, and no one deserves to die alone. And we need to see some serious changes in our system and how the RCMP deal with those kind of situations. The five officers were scheduled to appear in court tomorrow, but the case has now been adjourned till May 2nd. The family will be there tomorrow calling for justice for Dale Culver and all families across Canada that lost loved ones in interactions with the police. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Prince George. The remote northeastern Manitoba community of Shimadawa, roughly 750 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg, issued a state of emergency this week as it reels from a series of devastating events. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. They need a future. All they have is what, is what they can see. They can't see beyond the trees. 
Chief Jordan Hill of Shamatawa First Nation says young people in his community have no hope after a number of recent tragedies. He declared a state of emergency, citing the recent suicide of a young girl after her mother had called RCMP for help, and RCMP failed to take her to the nursing station. So this young girl was never proper assessed. Probably a week later or so, she succeeded. And the mother was crying for help, and now, just past Wednesday, the mother had committed suicide also. Hill is afraid this is just the beginning if nothing is done. His community is reeling from a fire at a nine-unit apartment building that housed the elderly. Their fire truck was not working at the time. And that fire worsened an already overcrowded housing problem as those displaced have to live with family. Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Kathy Merrick said the governments are failing First Nations. We are beggars in our own country, and it breaks my heart mm -hmm. sitting here today to hear the story of a mother cutting down her daughter, her baby girl, and not to get those services in the community. It breaks my heart to hear that that mother took her life three weeks after her daughter. Merrick called out both levels of government for failing to provide essential services while nations struggle with drug addiction, mental health problems, housing, and other social issues. She said First Nations are not asking for any more than any other Manitoban or Canadian. Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse says ending the crisis is going to take cooperation between the feds and province of Manitoba and the First Nations. Just a few weeks ago, you know, the Prime Minister had met with, you know, all these provinces, including the province of Manitoba, talking about uh, our health needs and our needs. And there's these big figures out there, and yet they don't even uh, want to talk to First Nations. This is the second time Shamatawa has had to declare a state of emergency. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We have to step aside for a moment. We'll have more news when we come back. Welcome back to APTN National News Weekend. A Canadian senator says the national capital region should put the brakes on plans to rename an Ottawa road. Donald Plett says John A. Macdonald may have played a role in the creation of the residential school system, but his legacy should not be erased. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. Named after Canada's first prime minister, the road begins just past the War Museum and goes on for nine kilometers. Donald Plett is the leader of the Conservative opposition in the Senate, and in an opinion piece in the Chamber's online magazine earlier this month, he wrote, If the very father of the country can be cancelled in this manner, what will be left with respect to Canada's founding as a nation, its settlement of immigrants across the country, and its constitutional history that remains worth celebrating? Back in January, the National Capital Commission decided to explore changing the name of the parkway, because McDonald authorized the creation of the residential school system. So Plett wrote, The effort to blame the entirety of the shameful history of residential schools on McDonald is, at its root, an ideologically driven campaign that seeks to vilify not only McDonald, but Canada itself. Uh, Quebec Senator Michelle Odette is in you, and she says she respects Plett's opinion, but the move to rename the parkway is reflective of a more complete understanding of Canada's history and McDonald's role in it. By renaming, I think it's a, a good action. Or by telling the truth, there's not only one truth in Canada. There is the truth of my colleague and friend, uh, this senator, and I hope he understands that there's also our truth. So for me, it's a good gesture when an organization or a politician or a movement is saying, we don't want that name anymore. 
and hear why. Adet says she believes Platt's opinion is a minority one and most Canadians are in favour of changes like renaming an Ottawa street. I will be angry if the majority deny that it happened. I would be angry, and I'm allowed to be angry, if the majority says, no, we're not going to change because it was like that. We cannot change the past. For me, yes, there's places that we can change the past. When asked for a comment, the National Capital Commission provided an emailed statement that says, the naming project is attempting to provide a more fulsome history of the area, as well as reflect the significance of the river, landscape and shoreline to Indigenous peoples and the community. Senator Platt's office declined comments, saying the article speaks for itself. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. Montreal's first ever permanent housing for homeless Indigenous people opened a few weeks ago. That's good news, but it's just a drop in the bucket. As rents skyrocket and vacancy rates plummet, homeless camps continue to face evictions and will continue to appear, say community organizers. Amelia Fournier has more. They are just moving us around with no reason. Trust me, no reason. Look up here. All this is nothing done. Jaco Stubbin almost lost his makeshift home under the Ville Marie Speedway in November. But Quebec's Transport Ministry and the City of Montreal decided to allow the homeless camp to stay up for the winter, postponing their construction in the area. It's safer here and it's more quiet. The people are nice. They mind their own business. We help each other. I give them food. Now, spring is coming up and so is their eviction date. Jaco doesn't understand why they can't just be moved to a spot they're not working on. For the last 10 years, that's what they always do. They move us to another corner and they continue working here. While Quebec's transport ministry says people need to clear out from under the bridge so construction can continue safely, David Chapman of Resilience Montreal says the campers will lose their sense of security and community if they're forced out. What happens is people will leave their various enca their encampment, they'll go in search of abandoned building, a construction site, or perhaps a dark alleyway somewhere, and they will actually be in a less safe circumstance. There are approximately 3,000 unhoused people in Montreal, and Chapman also says there's not nearly enough low-cost housing available for them, especially for those who don't fulfill admissions criteria, some of whom have been living at this camp in downtown Montreal. There will be inevitably small little encampments here and there, which appear uh, in the city uh, and it would be it seems to me that it would be wise to uh, for the city to jump out in front of that development and actually uh, you know sanction officially certain spaces for encampments. Expanding social housing capacity will take years to establish says Chapman so will the city of Montreal find a new campsite for this community of around 15 people in the meantime? Aliyah Hassan Kornal, the councillor advising on reconciliation, says... C'est pas quelque chose qui est discuté euh, en ce moment. Le, la priorité de la ville de Montréal, c'est de s'assurer qu'on est capable de pérenniser des ressources et d'avoir davantage de logements sociaux, parce que c'est sur le, le long terme qu'on doit focus. John Tessier is a support worker for the homeless and started his own organization, Advocacy Montreal. He knows the challenges of living on the street firsthand. Never a shortage of them in this neighborhood. A decade ago, he was battling addiction on the streets of Montreal. There's so many steps that need to be taken and you can fall through the cracks at any one of them. I mean, there's many organizations that will help you get into detox, but a week later, you're back on the street um, and you're back at square one. The newly opened Maison Aguatsire hopes to prevent that. It's a supervised housing center where tenants will have access to mental health and addiction services managed by Projet Autochtone du Québec, or PAC, a homeless support organization for Indigenous people. Heather Johnston, director of PAC, says... We've really focused on trying to provide housing for people, as I said, who may be facing multiple barriers to being housed, uh, and also um, who may have not succeeded in other housing programs or who have um, not have been rejected from other types of housing programs. Tenants will still have to pay 25% of their gross income to live there. The rest of the rental costs will be covered by Quebec and the City of Montreal. But Johnston says there's still not enough long-term funding secured for operations. Okay, we have the bricks and mortar, and that's great. We have this beautiful home, but then we need funding to make to provide the services. 
Quebec's housing ministry just cancelled its financing program for social housing. In a written French statement to APTN, Quebec's housing ministry didn't say whether social housing builds would accelerate, but they said they would, quote, continue to support Quebecers when they're confronted with challenges within the prevailing difficult economic context. Meanwhile this year, Montreal increased its police budget by the largest amount in the city's history, $63 million. There's a lot of money for police and for bike paths, but it doesn't seem like there's enough uh, funding for uh, grassroots community organizations um, and frontline workers that already have a relationship uh, with the community they're serving. While the future for people experiencing homelessness is uncertain, people like Chapman, Johnston and Tessier will continue to fight to put a roof over everyone's head. And as a community, we have to, we have to decide what's important to us. You know, um, do we care about people or we don't? Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Montreal. All right, we have to take one more quick pause here. Stay with us. Welcome back to APTN National News Weekend. For the last 20 years, a photo was the only image of Mi'kmaq regalia on display at a cultural center in Millbrook, Nova Scotia. Now, after 130 years in an Australian museum, that regalia is coming home. Inja Moore brings us this story. This is a photo of Mi'kmaq regalia on display at the Millbrook Cultural and Heritage Centre. Heather Stevens was a student at the centre about 20 years ago and asked where the real regalia was. Because at first I was told it was none of my business, um, and so me being a, a First Nations woman, being told, you know, it's not none of your business, well, um, it is. Um, so when I actually took over the management position here, um, that's when I started to take that role on. I'm like, yes, it is my business, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to get this back. Today, Stevens is the manager of the centre and next week she is flying to a Melbourne museum to bring the regalia home. It's been a very long time that, um, that, <laughs> that I was working on this. So bringing it home has been a long journey and to have it here for our people is so meaningful. Repatriating the regalia included Stevens appearing at the Canadian Heritage Committee five years ago for C-391, an act for a national strategy for the repatriation of Aboriginal cultural property. The act was tabled and dropped when an election was called, but Stevens persevered. Again, and that's when I knew I have to spearhead this. I have to get this piece back home. And so I've done it. Stevens says the regalia made by a Mi'kmaq woman from the Sabaganagati or Millbrook First Nation during the 1840s was commissioned by Samuel Haigu, a Canadian civil servant who died in Australia in 1891. He left the regalia to Museums Victoria, where it has been stored for the last 130 years. Because a lot of our artifacts are actually stored in drawers. Um, that nobody is able to see um, and that's not what our ancestors would have wanted. Stevens, working with experts, says the regalia will be protected as well as any museum. It is an understatement for our Mi'kmaq people about not being able to know how to care for things and, and if they're in a certain museum right now, leave them there because they know how to do it properly. Um, that is a misconception altogether. Um, so we have the technology here to be able to do that. The repatriation will include ceremony. A specialized case to preserve the regalia will be the feature display at the center. So having it here not only means um, you know, having people come in and share our history with us, but it also starts to have the spiritual, cultural uh, connection uh, to our ancestors. The regalia is expected to be revealed to the public in ceremony on National Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Millbrook, First Nation. Well, one of the performances at this year's Juno Awards in Edmonton focused on intergenerational trauma caused by the residential school system. It was over 300 kids that went to school. And I used to cry. I was lonesome. I was wondering why I was uh, sent here. 
It was a moving performance which featured a hologram of his grandfather's image, a jingle dress dancer, and the award-winning drum group Northern Cree. He told reporters after the show that he made the album as a way to remember his grandfather and his stories. Asanabi hails from the Sandy Lake First Nation in Northern Ontario. He said his biggest fear was that the song would traumatize residential school survivors, but he heard from at least two survivors recently that said they found it healing. An Algonquin powerlifter in the capital region is hoping to be on his A game. He's about to enter his first competition this spring, something that's been 10 years in the making. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Zach Liberty gives a brief description of his training technique. You gotta take really, really long rests in between sets. Sometimes you gotta rest for like three, four minutes because you gotta make sure you're as good as you were for that first set when you come back at it. There's no use in kind of working fast with this kind of stuff. You gotta recover and take your time. He's been pumping iron for the past decade, having caught the bug for it when he was in college, and it's stuck ever since. And it just um, got to be like a natural thing that I really, really got into. So I took a course to kind of get my feet wet about it. Uh, I had a really, really good instructor, and I just never stopped. The 28-year-old Algonquin from Pickwaknagon, Ontario, is now gearing up for his first provincial competition. Liberty says it takes a lot of time and preparation. I've been strength training for two winters, so it's kind of like a five to six month block, and then off and then back on. So I've been going since October this year. Liberty is joined today with his friend Aiden Lee. They met at this gym two years ago. They belong to two different powerlifting federations, but support each other's goals. It kind of just helps us motivate each other. I know sometimes we come in, we have completely different weights, completely different sets. Um, but the exercises that remain the same between our programs, we'll try to hit together. We'll just kind of swap out the weights between set to set. And um, a lot of this stuff is like neurological, like uh, it really fires you up if you have your, your mind there. Liberty proudly details the weight he can hoist. So I've deadlifted 405, squats 335, and bench 275. So. Uh, trying to beat those, yeah, and uh, some of them look like I can beat them right now, so I'm, I'm fingers crossed that I, that I have it together. He's training specifically for a Canadian powerlifting competition in Hamilton next month. I'll be heading there at the end of April and uh, hope to bring my A game for sure. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. All right, that's all we have for you on this edition of APTN National News Weekend. If you would like more details on any of our stories or you missed any of our stories from throughout this, this week, aptnnews.ca has you covered for that. I'm Daryl Stranger. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great weekend.